On this week's Back of the Grid, we're going to be talking about a hard-fought 1-2 for McLaren, a disastrous weekend for Red Bull, and we're going to talk about Team Radio like it's 2021 all over again. Let's go. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Back of the Grid. I am Chris, joined as always by Tom. Hello. Uh, To talk about a... I want to say Venful Hungarian Grand Prix. I think if you take the team radio out of it, it wasn't actually the best race in the world. There was sort of a lot of DRS trains, not a whole lot of order changing, but then you layer on top all of the uh, the team radio nonsense we had, and it was a bit more compelling, I suppose. Yeah, I think, unfortunately, for the most part, the team radio probably distracted away from what, could have actually been well, well actually, to be fair was a decent race playing out i think however the 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 drama of the radio between certain members of <laughs> teams and their drivers and vice versa was um yeah maybe overshadowing what was kind of some interesting strategy and some other things that were going on um which is a bit of a shame but yeah it was it was a weird one. It was a messy one. Um, I mean, we'll, we'll start at the front. I mean, in the end, we had a debut win for Piastri in only his second season in F1, um, who becomes the seventh race winner this season, which yeah. is unbelievable given where we started the year. Um, McLaren's second win of the season, their first 1-2 in uh, three years since Ricardo and Norris at Monza. Um, interestingly, McLaren's previous 1-2 was an Australian driver winning the race ahead of Norris with a Mercedes <laughs> on the podium with them and Hamilton Verstappen had a collision during the race, which sounds very familiar. All very familiar, yeah. <laughs> yeah, a bit of a weird on that. Um, but yeah, I mean, McLaren just made very hard work of what should have been a pretty straightforward one too didn't they yeah um are we are we going to do mclaren before we do red bull and that scenario yeah let's, we'll just, let's, just get in, let's get into okay. it yeah i think they made an absolute meal out of something that should have been so much simpler um yeah. there's a few different ways it could have played out but I think the situation that they put themselves in, they didn't even need to put themselves in to begin with. Um, and I mean, before I mean, this, this is the bit where either this week our listeners will all drop off within the five minute mark because of what I'm about to say, or <laughs> they'll stay, but we'll see. But basically, I'm sick of seeing this. They had to pit him to cover off Hamilton argument because it's nonsense. It's absolute nonsense. Hamilton was 26 seconds total, I think it was, yeah. down the road from Norris, uh, specifically from Norris. The pit lane loss with a pit stop is around 20 seconds in Hungary. So they essentially had six seconds in hand over Hamilton. Now, yes, Hamilton was sort of starting to close that gap, but if Hamilton had been closing in the same capacity I've seen half of the internet seem to think he was, then Oscar Piastri would have come out behind him, and Oscar Piastri came out with a four-second gap to Lewis Hamilton. Exactly, after pitting yeah. three laps later than Lando Norris did. And he was only two seconds, and before anyone goes, oh, well, he was ahead of Norris, he was ahead of Norris. Yes, he was, by two seconds. So ultimately, they lost basically the exact right amount of time. It was 26 seconds up the road from Hamilton. This is Norris. They lost around 20 seconds roughly in the pit stop, which means that he came... And he came out with like six seconds, a gap of about six seconds ahead of him. And he maintained that and then pulled away. And Hamilton was on hard tyres that he'd already had for, I want to say, 10, 15 laps at that point, maybe even more. I can't remember. I can't remember. That's the one bit I can't remember off the top of my head. Uh, who's that, sorry? Hamilton's hard tyres at the time that um, Norris came out. They were doing to double digits of age anyway. Um, yeah, definitely. So, like, he was always going to 
start getting slower. Like there was just no need to put themselves in that scenario. And I'm kind of a bit tired of seeing half the internet justify what McLaren were doing with that because, like I say, if if that was the case, Piastri wouldn't have come out ahead of Hamilton if it was as this subsection of the internet seems to think it was. And I yeah. think they just... I mean, all you have to do is listen to commentary. You've got experienced racing drivers, and yeah, albeit they're not world champions because we're talking about like um, Julian Palmer and David Coulthard on F1 TV when I was listening to it. But literally, the moment that was happening, both of them said, oh, I wonder if they're doing this to actually give Lando the win because it's better for the championship. Like, immediate reaction. Because that is realistically what it looked like they were doing. And like then if, they if, came on the radio and said to Oscar, we, "We've had to pit Norris to cover off Hamilton. We'll we'll sort this out later, or whatever it might be." But they genuinely didn't need to. Like I'm, I'm not an F1 strategist, but I've watched F1 for enough years and I've seen enough timing boards to know that that didn't need to happen when it needed to happen. And they made a rod for their own back from that moment forward. Absolutely. I mean, there's, there's, there's only really two explanations. Either you're trying to manipulate the order because you want the other car to win, or you are genuinely trying to cover off Hamilton, at which point you're just fighting ghosts. Because as you said, like, it was at the point Norris pitted, Hamilton was almost 10 seconds behind. And then afterwards, um, yeah, it was, it was just, just the gap was too big. You know, and again, you could say, oh, well, what if there was a slow stop? Well, if you have a slow stop, it doesn't matter what order you pit them in, he's going yeah. to lose the place. So, yeah. Yeah. And then that, that got us into this situation where Norris was ahead and the team basically pleading with him to slow down and let yeah. Piastri back through. Um, and I don't think... I've seen a lot of people trying to defend Norris here in that you know if you want to be in a if you want to win a championship you have to be ruthless like Schumacher wouldn't have done that Alonso wouldn't have done that etc etc Verstappen wouldn't do that etc etc but you can't at, at, until that point in the race Norris had been done off the start mm -hmm. um Piastri had pulled a gap in the first stint um it was about admittedly five, Norris four or lost five seconds, I think, was it? Um, yeah, admittedly Norris lost some time because he ended up behind Verstappen, um, who shouldn't have been ahead of him um, because he overtook off track. So that kind of negates that a little bit. Um, middle stint on the hards, Piastri stretched the gap to about four seconds. He did then make that mistake that dropped it back to 1.5, but he was still the faster driver in that middle stint. You end up with them in the wrong order because of the order that the the pit stops happen. And like, yeah, you, the argument is there. Well, Norris was pulling ahead; he was faster at that point, but he was in clean air. He was pushing harder than he otherwise would have done. Like, yeah, I don't think that argument pans out. And by Norris saying, "Oh, well, if he wants to pass pass me, he needs to catch me," you've, you're in a position where you're about to score the team's first one, two in three years don't put the team in a situation where you've got to tell one of your drivers to push flat out to catch the other one to prove a point because that's how mistakes happen. Like, it's just... And, and again, like, I am... Although I don't think Norris played that particularly smartly, ultimately he did the right thing. I don't think he played it particularly smartly. The blame does ultimately land on the team for putting the drivers in that position in the first place. Yeah, because... I mean, in reality, I think... If the decision is the decision and it still happens, I think what Norris probably needs to have done differently is let Piastri basically straight through as soon as Piastri had pitted. Because uh, yeah. I think the, the gap at that time was like two or three seconds. It wasn't huge. Yeah, um, just over two seconds. So at that point, he does something in order to let Piastri through and then spends... 15 20 laps whatever they had left at that point maybe it wasn't quite that many actually i'm thinking maybe it's more like 10 to 15 laps left but whatever it was at that point let them i mean let him push piastri yeah. and, and basically say 
I'm clearly faster. Let me back through. Like, and I don't, race, I don't, like... I don't fully subscribe to exactly the same line as think line of thinking as as what you were, Chris. Because I think yes, there's an argument to say Norris. Because this, this is what I keep seeing. I keep seeing like two sides to it. One side is, well, Norris shouldn't have lost the place off the start line, and the other argument from the other side is, well. Piastri should have been quicker on the mediums at the end, and it's that's that's just race. That is racing. Like, yeah, different drivers will be faster at different points. And if you're going to say that Norris should have done better at the start, you can equally say Piastri should have been faster on the mediums at the end, and vice versa. If you're gonna say, well, Piastri needed to be faster, you've got you can equally say, well. Norris should have thought about how he was fighting and who he was fighting into turn one and kept the position in the first place. But between those two moments, there's like 40-something laps of racing, more than. Yeah. And that's just the way it pans out sometimes. I think the problem here is the team have put them in a stupid position unnecessarily. And realistically, I think the only thing that should have been done differently from a driver perspective is Norris should have given the place back as quickly as possible and then essentially been on the gearbox proving yeah. you need to let me through here, look how fast I am. But they, they, probably, wouldn't like... have, they probably wouldn't have let him. They would have probably told him not. And I think that's probably why he did what he did because yeah. I think if he had let Piastri straight through, they wouldn't have then let him fight him whether he was faster or not because yeah, that'd have called it I off, distinctly sure. remember a, a radio message saying you can fight until the stops, I think it was, or something like that, or something you can like fight that, until yeah. the end of the 40s. I can't remember exactly how it was worded, but there was a radio message essentially saying, you can push Piastri until we get to a certain point and then the, we stay in formation. And that point would have been passed at that, at that moment. So if he had just let him straight through, they wouldn't have, they wouldn't have let him fight, I don't think. No, I don't think they would have done. And th- and this is another argument for me why it was right to swap the positions back because if they'd done the pit stops in the sensible order, Norris would have been behind. A, the team probably would have called the fight off at that point. And B, if you look at the pace Norris was opening that gap up in the final stint, I don't think he might have had enough pace to catch Piastri I don't think that was a big enough gap to guarantee he passed him anyway so it's not like you can make that mm-hmm. argument with any certainty anyway and and then on top of all of that the team have they've made themselves look a bit silly they've risked creating animosity between their drivers they've risked creating animosity between Norris and his race engineer which is like the most important relationship in Formula One and then also like this should have been like the biggest celebration for them and there was just this cloud hanging over not only a one two for the team but the first win for piastri like mm. everything about it. and like you've only look at kind of the fan reaction online like people have been left kind of just feeling a bit bleh, like a bad taste in the mouth through it all it's yeah it's very strange and we said the same thing after silverstone like mclaren yeah. just are making these they're not nailing these big decisions and on this occasion they had a fast enough car that it didn't really matter like they had a one two regardless of what they did but it's gonna hurt them at at other races for sure yeah um on the positive side for mclaren uh this moves them up into second place in the constructors now ahead of ferrari uh 51 points now is the gap to red bull um that gap is coming down rapidly. Yes. Um, Norris has cut Verstappen's lead in the Drivers' Championship to 76 points. Could have been 69 points had Norris won, but it's not. It's yep. 76. Um, Could have been within three is, races. Which is still... I did I did read the other day, actually, after... I think it was after Miami. In order to finish equal on points, Norris needed to... By the in order to finish equal on points uh, with Verstappen at the end of the season, Norris had to outscore him by an average of seven points a race. Since then, he's outscored him by an average of eight points a race. So, okay. in theory, the gap is coming down fast enough to keep that championship alive until the end of the season. But um, 
we'll talk about the championships and stuff a little later on i think yeah i think i think that's just quickly i think that's the other kind of egg on the face thing in all of this because ultimately i think they've kind of forgotten that they do have potential to be in a title fight as well yes which is something else and it's it's still an engineered win if it is an engineered win but surely they have to think about a scenario where they are one two like that and norris is taking home 17 points instead of 25 like when he is able to at the moment start closing that gap to verstappen like i I don't like an engineered win either way but if you're gonna engineer a win and force it to happen why are you doing it the way around that you are is yeah, the they, big they, thing for me. Yeah. But I agree, but also I think any result other than Piastri winning that race would have been extremely unfair because Piastri absolutely deserved to win that race. I could say the same about many times Bottas should have won a race, Chris. Well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> it wasn't nearly as egregious as some of the Mercedes ones or the Ferrari ones in years gone by. Yeah. Yeah, um, I mean... <laughs> It is what it is at the end of the day, but I think ultimately McLaren made a rod for their own back. Yeah, absolutely. They really need to learn from this. Yeah. Um, right, we've got a lot to get through this week, so we'll we'll move on to some other stuff. Um, yes. Mercedes, um, in theory, the hot conditions shouldn't really have suited their car, um, especially with it being a really limited circuit, but Hamilton, really good drive, um, sort of hung on to the leaders, did really well to hold off Verstappen. Um and the Ferraris who were chasing him down at the end for his 200th podium, which is a wild number. Yeah. Um, yeah, but really good drive from from Hamilton again. He's sort of very much like be on top of things again these last few races. Um, Russell's weekend was, it was kind of ruining qualifying, wasn't it? They they underfueled the car, which meant he couldn't do a second run. Um, mm-hmm. So he dropped out in Q1, which was a big old error for a team of their kind of caliber um but yeah shame for russell he um where did he finish in the end he didn't climb sick no he wasn't quite eighth. Eighth. eighth yeah so he got back into the points which isn't bad at this track i suppose um which moves us on to red bull um and a pretty miserable race for them really um i mean verstappen so we had the Verstappen initially took second at the start. I don't think anyone's really going to argue with him giving that place back. Like that was a pretty textbook overtaking off the track and getting an yeah. advantage. Um, and then he just spent the rest of the race complaining about everything. <laughs> like he was yeah. moaning about the car. He was moaning about the strategy he was given. He was moaning about what the drivers were doing. I mean. GP just seemed to completely lose patience with him towards the end of the race. Like, just, just seemed to lose his head. It was a, it was like the red mist again, wasn't it? Like, it was a version of Verstappen we've not seen in. Like, I've seen some people pointing to Austria this year, but even then, like, I think Verstappen was like. In Austria, I think he was um, firmly making his feelings known. But I don't think he quite lost his head in in this fashion. Um, I think GP on the pit wall says enough about that overall, doesn't it? I think yeah, completely seeing his body language and the tone and wording of what he was responding back to Max. I think there's. There's always been a, a sort of banter, let's call it, between them, like that that sort of typical British banter that they've obviously developed together, yeah, racing together for a team like based in a Milton Keynes. relationship. And yeah, I I get it. And on days that are absolutely fine, people like us can look at that and see that's just banter, that's just a it's just a thing, it's just you know that's an element of British humour that Max has picked up and 
GP is going through with him. Like, that's what that is. But Sunday was very much Max over the top complaining, being sarcastic and almost infantile about things like the whole he didn't leave me enough room, he moved under braking, all that kind of stuff. Like he was almost trying to be clever back to the FIA because of things that have gone against him in recent races, yeah. like in Austria. And to, for GP to literally respond to him and say, just stop it, Max, this is childish at this point. Like That, I think, shows how off the boil Verstappen was, just mentally wasn't in the right headspace, and how much GP had had enough of the petulance. Yeah, completely. Um, and I think... I think the one comment in particular from Max that stood out to me was when I think GP was like sort of telling him off a bit for not easing the tyres in and just like going straight out of the box and blitzing uh, it. Yeah, that and was Max that was the like, um, you know that was that wasn't a gentle enough introduction or it, yeah. something. It was a comment along those lines, wasn't it? And Max and was Max's just like, reply was "Don't effing give me like, this." Um, yeah, well, I know what like, I'm doing. I'm the driver here, mate. Shut the f yeah, up. You, like you, it was along got, them lines. You've got me into this situation now. I'm trying to fix the problem, and it's yeah. like that's not. <sighs> you're like you know you're not bigger than the team. You you're not on your own out there. Like you need to work with them. And <sighs> yeah, it was it was surprising surprising to hear that level of like mm. it, it was like it he was sort of talking like his biggest enemy that day was his own team yeah which is not the way you want to be and obviously it all culminated in that collision with hamilton um which went down as a racing incident um i'm go i'm gonna say something that might be a little bit controversial here I think Lewis was pushing the limits of what is and isn't considered moving in the braking zone. The argument will be that he was starting to turn into the corner, but I, he was starting to turn in much earlier on that straight than he ever had in the entire weekend. I would say that it wasn't necessarily moving under braking, but there was 100% an element of just making that turn in a little bit tighter for Max. Yes. And I think... However... There was, there was still plenty of room. There was nothing actually wrong with what he did, but there was an element of... We've used this analogy with the pair of them, I think, before, but it was... It smacked of giving him just enough rope to let him do it himself. Yeah. Like, he gave... He, he, he left enough room for him to make the corner, but put himself in a position that basically forced max to make his own mistake at that point and... and i think if i think if max had kept it under control then i think there would have been a very different discussion around that incident but the fact that max arrived to the scene with too much speed for the corner all locked up as soon as a driver does that you kind of haven't got a leg to stand on like yeah at best you're going to go down as a race instant at worst you're going to be held accountable for it um yeah. he's lucky he didn't do anything to take hamilton out or damage hamilton or anything well well in terms of like ruining what was hamilton's race at that moment because anything in the way that this gets policed in terms of the outcomes that would have been a penalty more than likely it's exactly the point i was going to make like if that instance had ended differently there would have been a penalty involved. Like, they yeah. absolutely were policing the outcome of that. Yeah. Like, yeah, Max came off worse. They both kept going. We'll just leave it at that kind of thing. The thing is, if he's not careful with the way that the McLarens are looking at the moment, and if McLarens sort themselves out in terms of what they're going to do in terms of prioritising a driver at some point, Max needs to be careful and think about looking over his shoulder because there's an element of if the Piastri Norris thing had gone a little bit differently, Norris is within three race wins of Verstappen at that point. And all it takes is silly little incidents like that, taking himself out of a race. And then that suddenly had less than two races. Then doing it again. It was... And it's less than three and uh, sorry, less than one and so on. So... Yeah. Because it is that, that incident turned a fourth fighting for third into a fifth place finish. And like, it's, the way things are going, the way things are looking, he can't afford to be dropping points like that. Like, yeah. 
And I think a lot of the frustration stems from there was a big old upgrade on his Red Bull this weekend and they still looked second fastest car at best. Yeah. Like about, really about on didn't... par with Hamilton in the Merc, probably. Yeah, probably. Like it didn't seem ha- Hamilton clearly getting a bit more out of the Merc than Russell's able to at the minute, and Verstappen clearly getting more out of the Red Bull. But I mean, he was yeah. one of the upgrades, wasn't he? I don't think Perez had any. Did Perez have any? Perez upgrades? didn't have them, no. No. So, but even still, Verstappen. Although, what does that tell you? I guess when Verstappen's struggling to get to grips with it and getting himself into red mist situations where he finishes fifth and Perez finishes somewhere in the points in seventh. Although, having said that, Perez did bin it in Q1 and start from the back. So, yeah, there is that too. I did enjoy, you know, the Simpsons monkey paw curling meme. One of those <laughs> where it was like, we need um, we need Perez and Verstappen to be finishing closer together. No, no, not like this. <laughs> yeah. Oh, um, talking of Perez... Out in Q1 again after a pretty heavy crash. Um, Really nasty one, actually. Like, just got spat out off the curb to the side. Um, Obviously, good to see he was okay. But at the time, I said, I think that's it. I think that Mm. that crash might be the final straw for him. Um, I mean, as it was, he actually had a pretty decent race. He climbed back up to seventh place. but. That is also seven races in a row now without a top six finish in a car that's generally been one of the best three cars on the grid all season. Yeah. yeah so I... still really not good enough. And as we've said, you've only got to look at the way the Constructors' Championship is closing to show the damage that's doing. Yeah, I think um, there's a lot of rumour at the minute that a decision might have already been made regardless of what's happened this weekend, isn't there? Yeah. So I wouldn't I wouldn't be surprised if we heard something in the summer and they're just letting it play out over the next couple yeah. of races because they're back to back going into the summer break. Short of him winning in Spa, I don't think there's anything that might change that at this point. Sorry, but that is not happening. That is not happening. Um we can move on to some of his potential replacements at the team formerly known as Minardi. Um, Go. Sonoda had a great race. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, he had a crash in qualifying, which was uh, unfortunate. Um, I think I think the crash he had in qualifying was probably bigger than the mistake deserved. He seemed to sort of catch the edge of the grass and sort of get pinged off into the air, but still a, a, a costly mistake to make. However, mm. in the race, he was the only driver to pull off a one-stop strategy. Um, yeah. And kept the tyres alive. End of an extra place as well. Yeah. Finished, finished ninth, ninth from 10th. Uh, head of the Aston Martins. Um, yeah, really good drive from him. Yeah. Um, on the other side of the garage, uh, Ricardo. Ricardo looked almost as angry as Verstappen after the race. He was <laughs> seething. Um, he, he did have a really good weekend. Like, he qualified ninth, um, and he had really good pace in the race but he started on mediums and the team brought him in after seven laps yeah that was weird. baffling because it almost looked like they'd forgotten what tires he was on and saw the people on softs pitting and were like oh we've got to react and bought him yeah. in like he's on mediums like he's on mediums it, putting in really good laps it completely voided any advantage that they may have had strategy wise by being on those tires it was absolutely shocking. Um, yeah. And he basically got stuck in traffic for the whole rest of the race and finished out of the points. Um, he deserved a much better result than that because he did have a yeah. really good weekend if you look at the, the lap times across the weekend. Yeah, it's a shame. That. Um, quickly rattle through the rest of the teams. Aston Martin, a better weekend on pace than previous few mm. races. Uh, both going to Q3, but on race pace, they dropped back, um, finished 10th and 11th. Um, interestingly, towards the end of the race, I think they let Stroll past Alonso because he was on fresher tyres to try and chase down Sonoda. And they were supposed to swap the positions back on the last lap. And Stroll just seemed to not respond to the message telling him to do it and just completely ignore them. Um, I'm sure Alonso's not that fussed over one point, but but there we go. I mean... Many out there would argue that's what Norris should have done. <laughs> well, yeah. 
Um, Haas, good qualifying for Hawk again in 11th, but they sort of, it was like Haas of old. They just really struggled on pace and fell back. Mm-hmm. Likewise for Williams, they both got into Q2, um, but faded in the race as well, so no points for them. Sauber had a pretty big up- upgrade for this race. Um, Bottas said that they'd made a step forward with it, but um, didn't really seem to translate into Didn't much. translate. Um, especially a track we were saying pack. last week, like, has generally suited them in the past, but yeah, still the only team with no points. They are rooted to the bottom. Yeah. And then finally... Alpine, um, yeah. just completely botched qualifying. Like we had that red flag, the session restarted, and they sat in the garage and watched everybody else go out, and were like, "Now nah, we're good. We won't put another lap in," and ended up rooted to the back of the grid. Like, yeah, bizarre Mental. decision. Mental. Um, Gasly then retired with a mechanical failure for the second race in a row. Um, Ocon improved like a place or two. He finished eighteenth. Uh, pretty awful for them. That's it. Falling back down teams. the pack, they look like they might have started to sort things out a little bit. Yeah, Alpine, and, and it's just all fallen away again. Last couple of races, they have just plummeted. Mm-hmm. Maybe a flash in the pan. There, a couple of okay results we saw from them. Maybe yeah, taking advantage had... of others having off weekends. I don't know. I'd have to probably go back and look at the actual races and kind of assess it in a little bit more detail, but it feels like it felt like they'd found some things that were wrong with the car and done something about resolving it. Now it feels like they were just getting lucky and they're back where they should be on yeah. pace. They had four races in a row with at least one of the cars in the points. And now they've had two, yeah. two pointless races again, both of mm-hmm. them with a the and, and being like solidly at the back as well. I think yeah. that's the other thing is just like being off the pace. It's it's not just like a, I don't know. It's not like Haas being out of the points this weekend because they're still somewhat in touch, but just not a weekend that's fallen for them. Like Alpine have completely fallen off altogether for the last couple of races. Yeah, so they really have. A bit worrying. Um, right. Should we have a driver of the day? Hmm. I said to you before we started, I really don't know where I want to go with this. Yeah. And I still don't, if I'm totally honest with you. Because I think there's too much at the front that was a bit tarnished, if you ask me. Um, Yeah, that's kind of where I'm at. Like, as much as Piastri had a great weekend, a great drive to win his first race... He did make a few mistakes throughout the race as well. Like, yeah, I, th- this was some of the other things that were kind of floating through my mind at the time that we're having the whole debate as well. But, uh, like during the race, I mean, like the whole debate rumbling on because you'd got Piastri like, sort of dipping wheels in the gravel and all sorts of stuff once he'd got on those fresh tires, and I was just sort of thinking he needs to be careful, otherwise he's gonna yeah. he's gonna end up binning it just doing like regular outlaps because he wasn't exactly pushing or anything like that he was comfortable to hamilton he'd obviously been told he was going to get the place back so there's like no need to be pushing over the top when he was on a new set of tires so yeah it's just it's it's a weird one for me i mean yeah there was part of me that wanted to just like throw it at george russell from coming from so far down the back (laughs) to finish solidly in the points um I think I genuinely don't know. Sonoda maybe if you're doing a one stop. Yeah, I'm leaning Sonoda. I think Hamilton and Leclerc are worth a mention. I think they both probably maximised what their cars were capable of doing. Mm. Um, I can go with Sonoda though. Making a one stop work here was very impressive. Like the only cars that finished ahead of him were McLaren's, Mercedes, Ferraris, and Red Bulls. Like that is a very much best of the rest performance so yeah and it keeps us away from any controversial driver for any reason so let's say in the comments (laughs) (laughs) everyone likes yuki yeah even harder i think is going to be move of the day this one was yeah again when we were talking before i was like thinking to myself where do i go with this the um, overtakes there were were basically all DRS passes into turn one, weren't they? Mm, like there the were a few attempts at turn sort of two and three, but I don't think anyone was, really came off. I don't know if this is what the the specific thing that you've got on the list, but there was a nice 
back and forth between Max and Lewis for a while before the In inevitable the happened um, later on. So there was... Max initially got past him, kind of getting into position with DRS in turn one, and then made it kind of stick around the outside of two and three, and just kind of played the long game with it. But then Lewis took it back, and then it kind of went on for a few more laps, and that was actually quite good racing, to be fair. So that probably worth a decent mention. Yeah, I think generally, like, just forget yeah, Verstappen and hamilton racing in general but i think particularly lewis's defending in the the middle stint when they're both on hards was was very good um i've seen some people mention uh oscar's start um which was mm. pretty good but it was all right um i think i was <sighs> it was it was just a typical inside line start i think like yeah it was good I've off the a... line but it wasn't there wasn't anything too spectacular about it or anything like that it wasn't like i've a seen a lot of people criticizing style. lando's start which we have done in the past as well apparently his actual getaway was fine but when he changed to second gear there was a bit of like a a stutter or a slip as he mm. changed gear the first time and that's kind of what did him in at the start so um, bogged him down a little bit <laughs> paul in discord says oscar came from a long way back on land <laughs> it's true it's very true it's very true yeah, I think let's let's go for like Hamilton's defending. We we don't do that very often, but it was yeah. it was kind of fun to watch him. Man, the two man, is, man is the bit where he might have turned in slightly early Mind just to bit, yeah. just to cause an issue. Ignore that bit, but the rest of it was fine. <laughs> uh, and then last award. Honestly, what the f- are we doing here? Do you want to We've go with a... ours, or do you want to go with the inbox one that we had? So yeah, we've got an inbox suggestion for this, which um, we're always happy to get. So if you want to send those in for future races, please do. Um, Hendrix says, I've got a positive WTF for these guys. I love the drone shots in the last few corners. To my knowledge, it's the first time the FIA included shots from a drone and not a helicopter. And I'm quite happy that F1 are embracing new camera angles with that technology. Love the podcast. Keep it up. Cheers from Germany. Um, I would say I found the drone shots mixed. (laughs) (laughs) It's, when they were good, they were very cool, and when they were bad, they were nauseating. We've had them before, and the last time we had them, they were awful. Hendrik <laughs> may not have seen that, but the yeah. last time it happened, it was awful. It could have even been our negative WTF Possibly. that race weekend. I genuinely can't remember when it was. Um, I feel like we've had them at, like somewhere that's got a little bit of a switch back or something similar Sarah to Discord this. Discord is saying Kota, and I think that might be right. Could be. Yeah, like last that year. That final maybe, sector, but... maybe, where you Possibly, kind yeah. of come in field and back out on yourself, maybe. Yeah. But it was cool. <laughs> like when, like I said, when they, when they were good, they were really cool. Yeah. But I know a lot but... of people have said they sort of felt a bit sick watching them. So Did we have some at Austria last year, maybe, as well? And I think in Austria. I feel like I'm there was one sure. where the drone tried to kind of chase the car down a straight. It was never, ever going to keep up with it. <laughs> and it made the shot pointless but I can't remember. Mm. So they've definitely tried it before, but maybe they've learned from the lessons because you've got, obviously, that that section is a lot slower speed than than other things, and yeah. there's a lot of switch back, so it's easier to kind of follow a car and switch back with it and and kind of do that. Like, I mean, it's if it's done a... well, at least it's not castle cam, come on. Or yeah, at least he was cam. focusing on the actual circuits and cars. Yeah. Um. It's actually, now I think about it, it's much like... Have you seen the Gran Turismo film? No, I've not watched it yet. Because they, they use a Hungara ring as a standing for Le Mans in that. And there is actually... Because they're just so similar. Yeah, so similar. <laughs> but I'm pretty sure there is some drone footage of those same last couple of corners in the Gran Turismo film. So maybe I saw that and went, like, you know what, we could have a bit of that. Yeah. Um, there you go, that's WTF of the week, using Hungara Ring to supplement <laughs> Le Mans. <laughs> yeah, it's really weird. Like, for anyone who knows, it is very obviously an aerial this... shot of the final corner of Hungara Ring, but yeah. they've superimposed the Le Mans paint from their final corner on the inside of the last corner. It's I, very funny. I love things like that where it's... Do you know that meme where it's got the guy just going, they'll never know, they'll never know. <laughs> How would they ever know? It's basically, it's that meme. 
<laughs> Classic. Um, I mean, there was a few. There was a few that were traditional WTFs in our sense of them. Um, yes. I mean, <laughs> one's quite interesting, which is how on earth did Max finish the race after being launched in the air like he was after making contact with Hamilton? Yeah. Um, he was like properly flung into the air at like 45 degrees and just was fine. Um, Crazy. Oh, another one I've just seen in the Discord which I wanted to mention. Have you seen any of the Sky footage of this race? No, just because of watching through F1 TV. So Crofty brought... When, when Max was being irate, Crofty brought up as a funny joke, like Max sounds like someone who's not got enough sleep last night because Max was taking part in the um, iRacing... I think it was the 24 Hours of Spa with mm. uh, Team Redline. And then Crofty mentioned the same thing again. And then again, it must have been five or six times throughout the race, he decided he was going to bring this up. And he's like, we get it. Shut up. Stop mentioning it. I mean, it's it like... yeah, it's typical dad joke crafty though, isn't it? One of the many reasons I obtained an F1 TV subscription because <laughs> I can't yeah. do that. I like how I say obtained. If you're if you're in the UK and you've ever tried to watch F1 TV, you probably know what I'm talking about. But still, um, <laughs> yeah, there's a reason I watch on F1 TV. Like Julian Palmer has his moments, like the one that I brought up the other week at Silverstone with the whole thing about. Um, well, Max didn't even defend that. He didn't even defend that. But then when everybody else does it, it's like, oh, there's no defending that. Like, So, yes, fair enough, Jolie Palmer has his moments, but I can deal with those once in a blue moon compared to the way Croft yeah. will beat a dead horse joke to oh, it. Oh, seriously, absolute it limit. It's Yeah. Um, so that could go on there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I suppose we have to mention Perez is qualifying again, but we're mm. just flogging a dead horse at that point. Um, yeah, let's not be crafty. <laughs> I mean, I, I kind of, it feels obvious, but I kind of want to say just how much of a meal McLaren made of a straight, what should have been a straightforward one too. Like I've never seen such hard work made of an easy one too. Yeah. I mean, they were always going to get a one too, weren't they? But they should be walking away from that circuit, full party mode, celebration. Yeah, elated. And it, it's just controversy. Yeah. All around. Like, they've Foolish. completely tarnished Piastri's first ever win. And I'm not saying it won't, he won't ever win again, but imagine if that's the only time he wins in F1. Right. Imagine. Like, it'll be it'll be like this little smudge forever. Of, yeah, but you only won because. Like, and just you only get to imagine win. that. For the first time once as well. I mean, That's a special thing for a driver. Listen to his radio message coming in. Like, I know the guy's pretty <laughs> cool and calm for the most yeah. part anyway, but the message on the radio, they're like, congratulating him. He's like, yeah, that was a good drive, guys. Thanks for uh, organizing the swap back. It was, yeah, it uh, was really like nice to get it done. Duh, duh. It, like, it felt like he didn't even want to win. It, it was almost like he felt kind of like he was on that other side of it that that you've got actually where apologized. It, it, it's like yeah he said something like sorry i made a meal of getting the place back or or whatever it yeah, was something but, like that and that almost strikes me as like the sort of humility in him going well actually lando is quicker now like it, the strategy just played out the way it is he's quicker than me and i can't catch up with him it's he can have it almost and it it says a lot when a driver's like that did oh, it sounds that dejected about their first win so that's yeah, that whole scenario is probably going to have to be the WTF, isn't it? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm in agreement. Okay. Uh, shall I run us through some predictions? Yeah. Which are probably something to forget about for us, much like they are f uh, the weekend is for McLaren in some aspects. But yeah, you and I managed absolutely naff all between us. You got a single point for Ricardo's 12th place. And I'm not even happy about that. I'd love to have been wrong because <laughs> he deserves yeah. so much more. <laughs> Yeah, even my, uh, yeah. I mean, I wasn't that much more optimistic. I said 11, but yeah. Um, over with the listeners, we got four people all finish on three points with varying different combinations of correct answers. The one unanimous one, though, was Lando Norris on pole. So well done to all. Um, the, the, we even had some Piastri wins uh, yeah. in there, which, to be fair, I'm, I'm not surprised. Like, I mean, I had him down on pole and he was pretty close to Norris, wasn't he? So 
yeah, strong weekend for the McLarens overall. Um, in terms of those three pointers, we've got Grace Mall, Matthew McPherson, uh, David Wright, and Christine Swoboda. I hope I'm saying that right. Um, but yeah, you all scored three points, so you were top this week. Um, in terms of the overall standing, Steen Nielsen does still lead the way uh, with 27 points. However, we have a a clear second place now with Gordon Barham on 25 points. Um, so either Gordon's pulled away from the others or the others have fallen away. I can't remember the maths. I need to get some kind of ongoing tally so we can <laughs> see where people were. I'll work on it for the off-season. Um, in terms of fantasy leagues, in the F- F1 fantasy, the official F1 fantasy, uh, Challenge the Throne was top this week with 257 points, but Ricky Bobby Racing does still lead the way with 2,985 overall. And then in Grid Rival, um, Airtown Centre, which is a great... <laughs> and probably only works if you're British or Scottish yeah. to some degree. Um, but <laughs> the Airtown Air Centre, and I keep wanting to say Airtown Centre now, Airtown <laughs> Centre had 986 points, and so nobody even managed 1,000 points on Grid Rival this week, which is a rarer occasion. Mm. Uh, but again there, Mighty Hawk 44 still leads the way. Mighty Hawk has 12,718 points. I believe Airtown Centre is someone from Discord as well, by the way. I can't remember who who I saw mention it, but I think someone did. So congrats. Anyway, um, that is it. If you want to get involved with any of that, if you want to get involved in Predictions League, it's always worth doing because if you get all five right on any given race weekend, you will win a prize. If you want to join the Fantasy League and the Grid Rival League, if you've been playing all season and been racking up points, pretty sure those carry over. So it's still worth joining the league just to see where you stand with everybody else. I'm pretty sure I'm right with that, but could be wrong. All the same, head to back the dot com. You can see everything there and uh, join all three. Spa time. Um, should we do a couple of quick storylines and then we'll just rattle straight couple. into predictions for yeah. Spa? Yeah. So a quick one from me. I mean, I guess these two are obvious, actually. A quick two from me, should I say, in that case. Will Max's recent form and also lack of teamwork <laughs> lead to issues again in Spa? I mean, I I want to say based on the history of that team that they will sort it out between now and then and they'll be back to like a unified whole, but it definitely feels like as as the car seems to get more into the pack and is no longer the fastest max's patience is decreasing at the same rate um mm-hmm. i think an interesting thing with red bull as well is which red bull will we see because obviously uh there were uh max and checo were running certainly two different engine covers there um, well a lot of the top body work but pe- something perez said sort of suggested that it's not a case of choosing one or the other to go forward it might even be that they will swap between them depending on the char- characteristics of the track um because the one max was running was more of a, a lower drag version so we'll maybe see that on both cars this weekend but might not be that for the rest of the season yeah so like circuits so like monza and things like that it's going to come in yeah more handy um yeah i guess that's going to be a factor in it I think that there's a little bit of Max that maybe sees the um, potential of the championship coming into grasps for somebody else. And yeah. it's maybe knocked him off of his usual... Because, look, the guy can be a bit obtuse, it can be a bit arrogant, but usually... Behind the wheel, he is pretty all there and gets the best out of what's in front of him, doesn't he? Like, not saying he doesn't make mistakes, not saying he doesn't have he hasn't had silly moments before, but generally speaking, not having the best car or having somebody challenge him generally doesn't actually lead to poor performance. However, when something has caused him to tip over that point of losing his cool or his patience or whatever it might be or lack of confidence in the card. It doesn't matter the reason, but 
the flip is really aggressive. Like, you know, it's there's a big difference, isn't there? Like, immediately, like, things don't go wrong very often, but when they do, they go catastrophically wrong, is, I guess, what I'm trying to get at. Like, look at um, when him and Hamilton came together at Monza. Like, he was maybe starting to feel things slipping away, and it's, it's, all, it's basically all or nothing. Like, he's yeah. either on the top of that podium picking up 25 points or he doesn't care if he gets zero very much like the likes of Senna was in his days like I am getting the most points here or I'm coming away with none and I don't care if I come away with none because I won't have won it's basically how Senna used to approach it and I feel like Max approaches it in very similar fashion of if I've got no chance of winning I'm just gonna absolutely steam my way through and if people don't move for me and it's race over that's it and i feel like that's a little bit like what the Vista- uh, the hamilton fight unfortunately turned into because it was good racing to begin with and then it turned into that and i think maybe that's that's the max we've got at the minute which is a little bit worrying because we all thought that we might have been past that <laughs> but he's, he's not think... had he's not had a, a really solid competition for a couple of years has he so yeah no that's a good point and i think also like Red Bull, Red Bull of old, as a cohesive unit, would have had a bad weekend like this and will have, you know, circled the wagons, sorted it out internally, probably turned up and dominated the next weekend. Mm. And obviously, with everything that has happened this year behind the scenes at Red Bull, I just don't get the impression that that cohesive family whole exists in the team anymore. So... Maybe that's part of the problem. Maybe that's why this GP and Verstappen relationship is falling apart a little bit because yeah, like where the GP's much... allegiances lie. Like yeah, there's there's a lot more going on in that team still, isn't there? Than you see at the surface on a race weekend. Like you'd be forgiven for thinking if you just watched the season that nothing was going on because you know any mention of it, any it, it just doesn't happen anymore, does it? Yeah. So. That whole thing with Horner at the start of the season has possibly, for all we know, affected like throughout the team, mm-hmm. especially because he's there in the paddock every weekend at the minute. Like, and they, as a team, they're just trying to go about their business as though it never happened. And depending on where people sit, like Max was kind of fairly vocal about the fact that if the guy's done something he shouldn't have been doing. He's like, obviously he never came out and said that, but like Max kind of took his stance to some degree. Cause there was this whole thing of him being at odds with Yoss, wasn't there? And I don't know, maybe there's yeah. all this bubbling under the surface that's leading us to where we are, but because it is all behind the scenes, you're just not seeing it up front. Like, like, I think as... for, for once I might actually get back into drive to survive. Cause hopefully there's a Netflix <laughs> camera being stuck under some of these conversations. Maybe. I think as a bigger picture as well, like a lot's been talked about with Verstappen's future and Toto has been pretty openly courting him. And, you know, you look at a driver like Hamilton who has stuck with, I mean, I say stuck with, he's leaving next season, but (laughs) he's stuck with Mercedes through them struggling. Like, Mm. I don't know, a a Vettel stuck with Ferrari when they weren't necessarily giving him a car that could fight for a championship. Um, You could make the same thing for Lando. You know, Lando was stuck with McLaren and believed in that project. I don't know if Verstappen is interested in sticking around long term if Red Bull stop winning so many races. Like, obviously, he's been there a long time and he has been there for rougher years. But if they do start tumbling down, like... He said he said before he's not interested in staying in F1 until he's, you know, late in his 30s and his 40s like other drivers have. And I don't think he's got much interest in sticking around t- to help a team work their way back up sort of thing. But I yeah, don't know, maybe that's just... I, think, I mean, it is speculation. Yeah, it is. It is, but I think it's fair speculation. Like, when you look at, obviously, all the turmoil that was thrown up in the team with everything that came out about Christian at the start of the season, you look at the fact that Adrian's left. Yeah, big like, factor. Well, you know, there's there's definitely a lot of elements there that if you are sat in that car in Verstappen's position, you're sort of thinking, am I on board a sinking ship here? And and that 
the the thing is we've we've all no doubt been in this situation in some way or another like you're in a job and you can see things just falling apart around you and you think i'm gonna go look for another job or you're in a relationship with someone you're like this relationship's not working anymore i'm gonna i'm gonna leave this but like it doesn't matter what the context is but you've, we've all been there where there's something happening around you and you're sort of looking at all these things and them up and going this isn't for me anymore like i i am out of whatever this situation is and it does probably lead to more of the just ranty unnecessary like argumentative side that we're seeing at the minute so maybe there is an element of him that's kind of almost checked out mentally like the car's fallen away a little bit it's not where it was and the key people who made the car what it was your likes of your Adrian Newey's and so on are like kind of disappearing from the team the team's disconnected because of what happened everything that came out at the start of the season maybe Max is sitting there thinking I might have had enough of this and that's what then leads to the banter with GP is a bit more annoying than just being banter now. And it leads to the snappy responses and it leads to a situation where he loses his head and he makes silly mistakes like questioning to people like Lewis Hamilton. Yeah. Um, <laughs> this is supposed to be a spa storyline. We've just kind of dissected yeah, we've gone really psychoanalysis off, off. on Max Verstappen's current state of mind. Yeah. Anything else for spa before we move on? <laughs> Will McLaren team order situation cause a spillover into this weekend? It's certainly going to be interesting if they are the fastest two cars again and they are fighting for a win between them because... Uh, and McLaren put themselves in a silly situation where they well, make a you would poor strategy not. call that puts a car in front of one that shouldn't be in front of the other. Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't believe that uh norris is going to be quite as courteous again in the future i get the feeling it it will go one of two ways it will either ignite something in norris and he'll somehow step it up another gear and gap piastri in the sense of that's not happening again or he will end up in a situation like Max where there's just an inner turmoil and he just can't stop crashing into things and, yeah. and making mistakes. But yeah, I don't think it'll go go away quietly because the media is not going to let it go away quietly. Over, I mean, we maybe we're lucky in the sense that we've got a spa and then a summer break. Yeah. So we'll at least hopefully come back from the summer break and it will have kind of been forgotten about. But I Good think it's gonna, it's definitely going to spill over into this weekend, unfortunately. Um, with that, shall we make some predictions for Spa? Oh, As we get yeah, near that hour mark. then. What do you want to say? I really, really don't know. Um, shall, shall I help you out with where I'm going to go with this? Yeah, just go on. Based on the feast or famine of Norris's outcomes from this. I'm going to go hmm. double Norris. I'm going to say Norris fastest in quality and Norris for the win. Um... And I'm going to say that this situation just ignites that. I'm going with that route of mm-hmm. it lights a new fire and he is becomes this demon that can't be stopped. Okay, I'm going to go the other direction. So, yeah, say... I was about to say Q first DNF Norris into turn one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say all these hopes and dreams of a championship fight before the summer break get crushed with a double Verstappen. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be like so interesting isn't it yeah <laughs> just, I mean, there is a little bit of logic there like the 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 sector in hungry where the red bull was fastest was the first sector which is mostly fast stuff um, who out of that front bunch now hasn't won this season um the only drive of the front runners that hasn't won this season is uh, it's going to be Perez, isn't it? Realistically, and then because Russell's yeah. won, Perez is going to be the lowest, the highest placed driver in the championship that's yeah, not definitely. won a race yet. Because bo- yeah, both Mercs have, both Ferraris have, there you go, what, McLarens have. Yeah, what should be a double Perez? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, that's not what we're here for because uh, <laughs> that's not what either of us have guessed. Uh, first DNF, where are you going to go? Gasly. 
hat trick. Going Gasly, Gasly hat trick. I said Ocon last week. I'm good that it wasn't. Um, they're not having the best time, are they? Do you know what? I'm just going to say Ocon again because it feels like it's going to be one or the other at the minute. Mm-hmm. feels like when we used to just predict a Haas, it's become predicting Alpine now. Um, <laughs> it really has. Number of finishes? It's been pretty high in recent races. Um, yeah. 18. Okay. I'm going to raise your 18 to 19 if I type them in the right boxes. Um, and then, can we have a random driver for this week, please, you Chris? May. It is Carlos Sainz. Oh, fifth. There, I did it. I just, I just had to... Yeah, fifth. Uh, that fifth sounds... Fifth. I, I sort of did the maths in my head and I ended with fifth as well, but do I want to go... This? Yeah, I go just... on. I just wanted to go. I just wanted to go gut because sometimes I overthink this and it never works awesome. out. So yeah, I just like well. gut. And I've got my science hat on. It's fit. Actually, yeah, there we go. Fifty-five. Carlos science hat on. Going fifth. Pretty All the fives. <laughs> Kismet, as they say. Um, right. I mentioned it earlier. Head to grid dot com if you want to get involved with the predictions league. All the rules are on there. I'm going to round it out with a bit of inbox. Is keep it safe now. I said I, but you read the first one, don't you, after I've yeah. predictions? <laughs> first one from Paul. Hey, man, should Lando have given the place to Oscar a lot sooner and then had more laps to try to overtake him? If he's going to do it, leaving it so late makes little sense, in my opinion. Yes. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, after the race, Lando said he was originally planning on giving the place back on the last lap, and it was only when um, his engineer mentioned the safety car window that he thought, oh, actually, I'd better do it now. I don't think I'd buy that version of the story, personally. Um, yeah, I do think he should have done it a lot earlier. I also think if he had done it earlier mclaren would have just called the race off so we wouldn't have had the chance to try and overtake him yeah like i was saying at the beginning um but yeah definitely should have done yeah i think that's that's the only way we would have had an actual chance without the team doing what they were doing is to give it back immediately and, and try and race that way uh, Sarah says, hey man, Max could have had P2 in Austria and P3 yesterday had he not been driving with Red Mist. We have seen Lewis, among others, end up on podiums that they technically have no business being on. Does Max have the ability or does his frustrations just get the better of him? Um, I think I think Max of these days has the odd race like this where he does, but you could also point to a lot of races where Max has just consolidated like the best possible results. Um, I'm trying to think of example, like recent examples now, which is tricky this year because it's been kind of feast or famine almost. But um, I mean, I guess an easy thing to jump back to, although people hate me using this exact number, but look at 2021. Like there were races where he did actually just consolidate the best finish possible and it's what kept him in the title fight until the end in theory definitely so it's not like he's not got it in him i just think that maybe there's an element of all that stuff we were talking about before where there's so much going on under the surface in that team that it's kind of boiling over and it's affecting the performance i don't know yeah i mean look at the um the Russian Grand Prix in 2021, the one that yeah. uh, Lando led, like that was, if I remember rightly, a pretty ropey race for um, for Verstappen. I think he, oh yeah, he didn't. He, he started last basically. Um, I can't remember yeah. if he was a qualifying issue or whether he took a new power unit. But that was very much a race of like consolidate, do what you can. And in the end, with the chaos, he ended up finishing second. But um, yeah, yeah. He's, he's definitely got it in him. It's just he has these moments where he does seem to lose his head that certainly Lewis Hamilton doesn't have. Um, I, you know, I don't. I guess Sebastian Vettel had his moments, but not nearly as often. <laughs> that so was... Likewise with Alonso, I don't think he like properly loses his head quite so much. 
Alonso is probably actually the the most collected of all those champions you've just mentioned, because they've all yeah. had their moments, and I think despite Alonso being one of the more vocal out of a lot of them, he's actually generally driving wise probably one of the coolest of the bunch. Mm-hmm. I think I think I'd have to go back to like him playing silly games with Hamilton when they were teammates at McLaren for his scenarios. And that's not even, that's not even like what we're talking about. Cause we're talking about like, I guess making mistakes and losing out because of being in the wrong frame of mind. That was just like, I can't say the word I want to say cause it's, it, <laughs> well, I mean, I, I can, but I'm not gonna, but yeah, it's just, like, there's a term for it here in the uk i'm sure people know where i'm going with it but that that's what he was doing essentially alonso i think back then but he's never like really lost his head or anything he's just been very vocal but he still gets the job done despite yeah, that Yeah, exactly so yeah um next one next question from benson uh hey man regardless of safety ratings from the fia what track uh <laughs> anywhere in the world would you like to see on the calendar conversely which track would you take off the current calendar hmm very good question i mean i've always kind of leaned into laguna seca for for this one or laguna seca however you're supposed to say that it. is a good choice because um, i'd love i'd love to see f1 cars going full beans through the corkscrew i would absolutely it would be, love it it would be cool um i think I, i'm also picking american track i'm gonna go watkins Glen. i think that would yeah. be excellent to see f1 cars going around but chris we don't need any more races in america <laughs> Oh no, I'm just replacing Miami. <laughs> Don't you All right. worry. Oh yeah, that's fine. And I'll replace Vegas. There we go. Problem solved. Um, as for what I take off the calendar... <laughs> We've just done it. <laughs> Miami and Vegas. Oh, yeah, Get rid of those two and go to Watkins Glen and Laguna Seca instead. I don't know. I, Problem I, I solved. Think, I think Vegas has got some good races in it. I think, yeah, my, Miami can go. Or I wouldn't mind seeing the back of Saudi Arabia either. Um, yeah. I mean, I've never liked Singapore, but I know a lot of people do, so I'm not going to... I'm not gonna throw that under the bus. <laughs> Fair. Um, next, Chris, not you, Chris, a different no. Chris, says, "Is Lewis Hamilton playing Max Verstappen like a fiddle?" <laughs> I think he did this weekend. I think he knew, like I said before, I think he knew an element of what he was doing in terms of putting his car where he put it, and he was basically saying, "It's yours to make the mistake, Maxi boy," and he let him do it, didn't he? Yeah, it's a good point, actually. Uh, there, was, um, there was a little bit... I, I kind of... Just to try and condense down inbox a little bit, I did cut some of this out, but Chris did make some points around, like, you could almost see it in his face when Max... When he was being asked about the Max situation, there was almost, like, a wry smirk, smile of, yeah. like... Yeah, I know what I did, but... Yeah, it's conjecture, isn't it? Like, yeah, he could have been said, just smiling. He, <laughs> he, he said something happy. like, oh, there's no... Uh, there's no aggro from my side, but with with Max there always is, or something like mm. that. Like, yeah, yeah. He knows so who he, he is. yes, I think in short, yes, I think he did try and play him like a fiddle. Uh, it's me next from it Simon is. Molyneux, uh, who says Oscar was brilliant. Lando made the right but wrong decision. <laughs> McLaren were awesome all weekend. Do we possibly have both championships up for grabs? I mean, in theory, yes. And just from a spectator standpoint, from ultimate neutrality, I I would like to think so, yes, as well. Constructors absolutely is wide open. Yeah, 100% constructors. I think drivers, there needs to be a balance between what went on this weekend and sometimes realising that they do need to prioritise Lando. Maybe, I know it's been a dead horse at this point in this episode, but maybe that's what changes going forward is the decision's gone this way for Piastri and that's how they've done it and there'll be an element of if it comes down to it in future it will be remember they did actually give you the win in Hungary Oscar <laughs> like yeah it's and I think maybe that's why Norris didn't just be a bit of a douchebag and still win the race like he gave it back because it was a case of at some point, I'm potentially going to have to be given a place by him if I am going to stay in this title fight. And to be fair, Piastri has played the team orders game pretty fairly up to he this has, point yeah, in the past, in this season and last season. So it's always been pretty fair. Um, so, yeah, I think 
a bit of a long game there, but uh, yeah, hopefully, hopefully it will lead to Max's implosion leads to Norris or someone else for that matter. I don't even care who it is at this point. Just someone closing it down. There was a, there was an interesting again going back to the radio messages, but there was there was a point where. I can't remember the exact word, but Norris said something to the effect of, I'm in a championship fight. So he he believes that this championship is on. I mean, to be fair, why wouldn't you? It's like, true. Come on, we were saying that, I don't know, Leclerc or someone was in it earlier in the season when he was like 75 points behind Verstappen. And Norris had was well within his rights to be 75 points or less behind Verstappen at this point. Um, so I think... He's within his rights to say, I'm in a championship fight in all regards. Because at the end of the day, he's the closest person to Verstappen and he's been finishing ahead of him over the last few races. Like, if, there's any, if, if anyone ever said, define a championship fight and, and putting yourself in contention for it, that's it, isn't it? Is being consistently at the front and ahead of the guy who's actually leading the championship. He's been doing that. So, But then again, to be fair to Piastri, so is Piastri. It's just that... Piastri's coming from further back yeah, in the totally. standings. Like, where's where's he now, Piastri, in the standings? He like, fourth, fifth? Because I, I still don't think he's, he's, not jumped, he's not jumped either of Ferraris yet, I don't think, has he, Piastri? No, he's, 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 he's very between very Sainz close. and Hamilton. Yeah. But, he's catching signs, yeah. Yeah, so... Yeah, I think that there's an element of that as well. Um, is it me next? Is me next? Tom yes. Murray says, Salutations, gentlemen. Which debrief would you have rather been a fly on the wall for after this weekend? The McLaren one or the Red Bull one? Oof. I think the Red Bull one, to be honest. Like, Yeah. Just to, like the, the dynamic within McLaren, I think, was pretty clear to see Like after that race. like I think any, everyone can generally see what went right, what went wrong there and where the relationships kind of lie and where they're likely to lie. Red Bull yeah. is a really hard read right now. Like, it feels like a team that's a bit divided at the moment. Yeah, I think I alluded to it before when I said I hope Netflix were there and had a camera under yes, some of these conversations seriously. going on. Like, I think it might make me much trying to survive next year just to find out what is going on in that team, to be <laughs> fair. Um, but yeah, I'd definitely rather be in the McLaren. Uh, sorry, the Red Bull one than the McLaren one. Um, finally, we have a question from someone called Stu. Who? Yeah. Um, <laughs> he says McLaren have finished fourth and third in the last couple of seasons. Has this dropped them right in the sweet spot of balance of performance slash development rules for them to be having the comeback they're experiencing? I think if a team has the kind of resource McLaren has, third or fourth seems a nice place to be with teams ahead being so restricted in CFD and wind tunnel time. I mean, there will 100% be an element of that, won't they, in what they've I done. I think it's a really good point, yeah. Um, I think I think this is legitimately why Red Bull don't care about the constructors overall. They would happily probably finish second or even third as long as they won the world driver's title. Ferrari were like that for years, probably even, again, even more so now that we live in this... Uh, era where you've got that less development time for being punished but on the flip side look at Ferrari Ferrari finished a place above them so yes fair enough we'll have had less CFD time but Ferrari are still falling away and kind of nowhere at the minute and they're not in that different situation to McLaren so I think it's 100% an element but it's also got to be about who you've got applying that time like you could have the most CFD time in the world, but if you've not got the right minds designing the vehicles that are going into CFD, you could you like you could put me in charge of a team's aero, and with <laughs> a million trillion hours of CFD time, I'm not going to build something that's going to beat Adrian Newey. I'll probably build something that barely even compete, even with millions of hours of CFD time. So, yeah, it's like... It's one of those things, isn't it? I think there's a combination there. There's a 100% an advantage given to them because they've got more than some of those teams ahead of them. But again, I guess there's another one. Look at Aston Martin. Aston Martin finished behind McLaren last year. Where are they? They're nowhere. Yeah. I mean, they've so, probably, got, probably got a higher budget, I would think. 
Well, I guess they're both operating the budget cap at this point in time. Yeah, I, I would but... say that I would say that those top five teams, like Red Bull, Mercedes, Ferrari, McLaren, and Aston Martin, operate at budget cap. Yeah, and then anyone else below that probably doesn't get near budget cap. But, but yeah, yeah, it, it... It's, it's a combination. It's yes, it's helpful to have more hours than teams above you, but you've still got to have the right people deploying those hours and those those elements otherwise it's it's wasted anyway yeah i think mclaren definitely have a, a good balance of safety and wind tunnel time and money and people right now and i think that that combination is definitely in, in that sweet yeah. spot so sarah's yeah. made a very good point briefly in chat of um the fact that there is a bit of a reset when it comes to mid-season anyway. To... It's just recently changed, hasn't it? Yeah, so obviously when you think about where they were to where they are now, um, because they're now in second, it's going to have sort of swung the balance back towards, say, Mercedes, who have dropped off a little bit. So I guess there's also, this, this again comes back to it, is probably why McLaren went quite aggressive getting the upgrades on the car as quickly as possible to be able to compete again is because of exactly that. Like, If those upgrades work and it it pulls in Red Bull and it gets them to the front of the pack, they're then going to have less CFD time for the remainder of the season and That's... It's, it's, another, it's another game you've got to play, isn't it? You've got to play with the rules. So... That's a point, actually. I wonder when... Do you know when it re did the reset? Off the top of my head, I couldn't tell you when the reset is, no. And I'd kind of... I'm going to say, admittedly say I'd forgotten about it until Sarah in the Discord said they reset it mid-season. Oh, it was, it, was the end, it was the end of June. So... Oh, yeah. Which means Ferrari will have had the losses from being in second place in the championship and then immediately dropped out of second place in the championship. <laughs> Ouch. That's that's pretty peak Ferrari. Okay, so um, McLaren didn't drop as much as I thought then because they'll have been third at that time, weren't they? Give or take. Uh, I'm trying to remember when McLaren leapfrog, leap, leapfrogged Ferrari. It was in the last couple of races, wasn't it? So it'll probably have been Ferrari in second, like you say. That's, they've got the disadvantage of hurt, the CFD yeah. time of a second-place team, but they're now in third place. Oh, dear. Right. Mamma I think mia. that... Um, just about wraps us up for the week so thank you as ever for joining us everybody um we'll be back in a week's time to review the belgian grand prix leading us into the summer break a well-earned summer break for everyone even slightly connected to f1 i think uh, after a, a hectic first half of the season um as ever back the grid.com if you want to take a look at the predictions league and see how to get involved with that uh, or to contact us you can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all of those things. If you want to join our friends on Discord, you can go to patreon.com slash back of the grid to find out how to do that. But I think that's all of the things. So yeah, we're back in a week's time. But until then, thank you and goodbye. Bye, everyone.